Hey, welcome to the Weekend Bite presented by The Wall Street Breakfast. I'm Daniel Snyder, and thanks for tuning in. I want to remind everyone that you're look if you're looking for quick day-to-day -day recaps of how Russia's invasion of Ukraine is affecting markets, the Wall Street Breakfast newsletter team is doing an amazing job getting that into your inbox every morning. And it's free. So why wouldn't you sign up for it? Head to SeekingAlpha.com or use the QR code on your screen here to sign up for that. Now, this week, we've received definitive remarks from Powell that in two weeks' time, the market should expect a 25 basis point hike. Upon that news, the market rallied and we saw a pullback as well. But is it too soon to pile back into the market or is the bottom in? And that leads us right up to asking our first guest on today's episode, Eric Bazmachin from EPV Macro Research found on Seeking Alpha Marketplace. Eric, thanks for joining me today. We saw the ISM February service PMI number this week come in under estimates as well. So the service sector is slowing and you heard the intro. So I'm just kind of wondering, is the bottom in and is now the time to start buying the dip? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. So um, my framework involves tracking the direction of growth, uh, not necessarily the absolute level of growth, but the direction or what we call the rate of change in growth. Uh, and I brought a couple of charts uh, with me. Uh, the first chart that you can show is the four panel chart that shows what I call coincident indicators. So coincident indicators don't tell you where the economy is heading. They define the current trend. So what we can see here is the four corners of the economy, industrial production, uh, non-farm payrolls, real, consum uh, uh, real consumption, and real personal income. Every economy has these four corners. And again, what we're tracking is the direction of economic growth. And what we can see here is that the economic growth rate is declining across production, employment, income, and consumption. And then we got another number today ISM services, which corroborates this view that the growth rate in the economy is coming down. Now, that doesn't mean negative growth, but it means the growth rate is slowing. Okay, so what does that all mean? That generally means when you're in a, a cyclical downturn in growth that you have significantly increased volatility across asset prices. And what you'll note in this chart is that the growth rate peaked in March of 2021 across basically all four segments of the economy. So for the past one year, the economic growth rate has been declining. And if investors pull up any of their charts, they'll note that around that March 21 uh, inflection point is when everything started to change. All of the, uh, the high, uh, high flyer story stocks that are you know, very common in the ARK ETF all started to peak around that point. Uh, uh, Long-term interest rates peaked in March of 2021. So Generally, when the growth rate in the economy is decelerating, which it still is, you're going to have a volatility in the marketplace. So this is not necessarily a dip that I would be buying because the growth rate is going to continue to decline and the Fed is going to tighten monetary policy into that slowing environment. And generally speaking, you know, geopolitic, uh, geopolitics aside, that's a, uh, a recipe for, for more volatility to come. Yeah. So I want to I want to just read this real quick. You recently put out a note to your audience and where you said, while it's clear that the real economic growth is moving to the downside, talking about your four major uh, coincident indicators, uh, it's equally as clear that the inflation rate continues to rise. Also adding, interestingly, despite the headline rate of inflation rising, the U.S. bond market remains relatively unconcerned about lasting price pressure. Um, so I'm wondering after this entire week, we saw huge movements in the 10 year yield. It seems like the bond market might be a little confused. So do you still hold that view? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we what we saw basically this week was the front end of the Treasury curve pricing. Uh, we priced out a rate hike and then we priced back in the rate hike basically two days later. So when we priced uh, several days ago, we had basically six rate hikes priced into the Treasury curve over the next 12 to 16 months. So six rate hikes. Then Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, the market got volatile, and the market basically swung in the other direction and said, we're only going to have four and a half rate hikes. Then Powell gave his testimony and said, no, no, we're, we're still going to hike rates, and we swung back. So what happened is the front end of the Treasury curve was moving up and down, sort of trying to guess how many rate hikes we were going to get. And when the front end of the Treasury curve moves, the back end of the Treasury curve rises or falls in sympathy. But this, the real signal from the bond market 
is not necessarily the the 10 year yield or the 30 year yield it's the slope of the yield curve so if you could pull up the chart that i brought of the 10 year minus two year yield spread that's the economic signal you can use other charts uh, other yield spreads but the 10 year minus two year is is most common so what you'll see on this chart is the yield spread between the 10 year and the two year treasury peaked uncoincidentally in March of 2021, when the economic growth rate peaked and the yield curve has been flattening, which is a symptom or, or, or a signal that the bond market's expecting slower economic growth and muted inflation expectations over the longer term as a result of the uh, aggressive monetary policy. So while the front end of the treasury curve was moving and the 10 year treasury was moving basically 20 basis points up and down over the last couple of days, the spread between the two of them was relatively unchanged, and we're actually at a new low today. So Powell gave his testimony. He said, we're still going to hike rates. We had the ISM number that confirmed growth is slowing. When you have tighter monetary policy into slower growth, that translates to a flatter yield curve. So the signal from the bond market is really in the slope of the yield curve, and that continues to paint the picture of slowing growth, muted inflation expectations down the road as the Fed starts to tighten monetary policy. And I would also make the point, Daniel, I'm sorry to, to, to ramble on here. Uh, sure. I, I don't believe we've ever been in a situation where the twos, tens curve or various other spreads has been this compressed before the first rate hike. If you want to throw that chart back up on the screen, um, we're at 33 basis points and we haven't hiked interest rates once yet. Everyone is aware of the dreaded inversion and you know what that generally means, but we've never been this flat on the yield curve before we've even hiked interest rates once. So that's that's really telling you something. So the bond market, in my view, is speaking quite loudly. Yeah, and just to clarify, the inversion typically meaning that a recession is around the corner, right? What's what's the time frame on that? Typically, it's when the when the credit. Yeah, the lead lag time varies, but but generally within eight to twelve months, you're usually in a recession. But the economy is you know already slowing quite a bit at that point. Even though that we have the Fed coming out saying that you know the market is better than ever, right? The people have savings. It, it seems and... to ha it seems to happen every time. And and just a point for investors, you know, inversion is the signal that people generally look for, but it's not really a magic line, right? If the yield curve was positive 0.1% or negative 0.1%, it's not like that one basis point all of a sudden flips the signal. The, the signal's really in the direction. Is it flattening or steepening? If the bond market was very concerned about you know, overheating economic growth or you know, a, a, a lasting inflationary scenario, we would see the bond market or, or have a steepening yield curve, which would inflect rising expectations of of growth and or inflation despite continued interest rate hikes, but we're seeing the opposite. Yeah. And obviously Powell wants to see that, Stephen, which he's mentioned, but you tee this up perfectly, Eric. So I want to continue on later on in your note, you said excluding government transfer payments, real income growth continues to roll over and is now $654 billion short of pre-COVID trend line. Outside the COVID decline, this massive income gap is the largest since the 2008 financial crisis going on to say as consumers feel their real income fall massively short of their expected income trajectory, we will see demand destruction intensify going on. Credit will increase, savings decrease. Um, you know, commodity prices are rising. We have everything going on with Russia and Ukraine. Obviously, the, the entire oil market's trying to figure out what to do there. Is Iran going to start turning on their taps if they can figure out the nuclear deal? you know, the free markets working where there's reports of people just not even buying Russian oil, even at a discount. Mm -hmm. um, is this what leads to that whole section of credit card increase coming and savings decreasing? And where does that put the consumer? Yeah, exactly right. So uh, the, the best chart for this one is the one of real personal income, excluding transfer payments. And what you'll see on this chart is, uh, and just to set the stage, this chart is uh, all personal income. So it's not just wages. It includes wages, dividends, interest, uh, self-employment income. Uh, it's, it's the whole pie, but excluding what comes from the government and netting out inflation. So this is basically uh, everything. This is real earned income in the economy. And what you'll note is that we were growing at about a 2.9% pace. We generally hugged the trend line pretty close for the last economic expansion. And what we're seeing is we, we had a big decline because of uh, the COVID recession. We bounced back a little bit, but we never regained that trend line. 
And now because of this persistently high inflation here in the near term, real income growth is actually falling. And you can see that hook down on the, on the very right hand side. And that gap between the black line and the red line is now 650 billion. So um, what, what that's going to do is that's going to exacerbate this, this condition of, of consumers feeling like they're falling behind. Their standard of living is declining. And to, to bridge this gap between where people thought they were going to be and where they are now, they're either going to have to draw down savings or borrow on credit cards or delay purchases altogether. And what we're noticing is that in the last personal income report, uh, where that data comes from, the personal savings rate dropped to 6.4%, which is the lowest level since December of 2013. So the personal savings rate is below the averages of the last 10 years. We're no longer dealing with this extremely high savings rate scenario. And the, the next chart that I brought is real disposable income per capita. And this includes the government transfer payments. So you can see those big spikes were the stimulus checks that were sent out. That trend line over the last expansion was only about 1.7%. And what's really amazing is that despite all of the effort that the government uh, made to try and keep incomes afloat, we're still falling below that trend line of the last expansion, meaning that over the last 13 years, 12 years, real income has not sustained a 1.7% pace which speaks to the fact as to why the last economic expansion was so poor. So what we're really seeing here is these high uh, commodity prices, rent prices, food prices, and all of these numbers do not include the recent rises that we're seeing because of Russia and Ukraine. So these numbers are going to cycle down even further. And if you want to throw that four factor uh, chart back up, Daniel, what you'll see on the bottom right is real personal income. And that's what's declining most rapidly. And again, that doesn't include the recent rise in commodity prices. So it's very, very clear that in the next couple of months, that line is going to decline even further. Or that growth rate is going to decline even further, likely into negative territory. So we're going to be in a situation where we have negative real income growth. And the question is, is the consumer able to hold on? Is that personal consumption able to hold on? If not, then it starts to cycle through the rest of the economy. So this is a precarious situation that we're in with real income starting to decline. And that's likely to get worse with the events that we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, that's all really great information. Obviously, thanks for bringing those charts as well. I think it helps people kind of visualize better what we're, we have going on here within the economy, especially post-COVID. Um, but I've got to ask you, before we let you go... What do you consider as the biggest risk right now for the market and how should investors be positioning themselves? OK, so the biggest risk is, you know, I, I generally don't uh, try and play geopolitical events because I'm not a geopolitical expert. So what I do is I position for the cyclical trends, which right now is a declining cyclical trend. And then if we have an adverse shock that happens, you're already in position for the cyclical downturn. Conversely, if we were in a cyclical upturn, I would more or less ignore geopolitical issues because the economic momentum's to the upside and the economy generally has the momentum needed to uh, withstand any economic shocks. Two good examples of this would be 2016. We had the surprise Brexit election and the surprise election of uh, uh, Donald Trump. Both of those were shocks to the marketplace in terms of unexpected events, but the economy was in a cyclical upturn. We had a very brief correction the market rebounded to all-time highs. It basically absorbed the economic shock. This situation is different where we have the momentum already to the downside. So the biggest risk is declining economic growth and then tightening monetary policy into declining growth. And that is generally a high-risk cocktail, uh, geopolitics uh, aside. You throw a geopolitical shock on top of that, that would exacerbate the downward momentum. So the way that I'm positioning for this is, is quite defensively. Depending on how you position your asset allocation, your fixed income bucket would, would, it should be skewed to a long duration, long duration treasury bonds. Your um, equity exposure should be tilted towards defensive equity exposures, things like utilities, consumer staples, uh, or even your large big uh, mega cap technology stocks. Uh, uh, other expressions of, of defense would be large caps over small caps. Uh, basically, whatever investment uh, strategy that you're running, the one word that you should simplify uh, your strategy down to is for the next several months, defense over offense, given the economic environment. Gotcha. All right. Well, as always, Eric, we appreciate your time. You have a great weekend and we'll talk again here soon. All right. Thanks so much. Now.
Let's go ahead and bring in our headliner for today's episode, George Ball, chairman at Sanders Morris Harris. George, you are a legend in these markets. You went from stockbroker to CEO and chairman, even spending time as governor of the American Stock Exchange and CBOE. Your firm holds a significant amount of assets under management, and you are exactly who we need to hear from right now. So can you please tell our audience what they need to know in such a crucial time in the markets such as this? Well, let me start by defining a legend as, as being the same as a has been. And I'm much more of a has been. Than, I'm than sure any, there's disagreement than, there, but OK. Than, than, than anything else. Um, it's a fascinating time in the investment marketplaces. Uh, and one of, one of the wonderful things about having uh, many, maybe perhaps too many years of experience in it is things are never the same. You can't simply look backward and and uh, say, here's what happened in 2015. Here's what happened in uh, 1995 and, and forecast the future. Uh, I think there are three things that are very clear today. Uh, one is the market has surprised everybody by not being worse than it has been since the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. There's some, some reasons to explain it, but that's that's been a surprise. The second thing is it's probably a wonderful time to hold a whole bunch of cash uh, for uh, the reasons actually just cited. Uh, nobody knows with any certainty, even a high degree of probabilities, what's going to happen next. And over the shorter term, cash is the great risk shredder. Uh, people who would normally hold 5% cash in their accounts would probably be well advised to have 10 to 15 to 20% cash because it'll give them the opportunity to react uh, one way or the other uh, as uh, economic and geopolitical events uh, uh, unfold. Thirdly, what's happening today impacts the market less over uh, a period of time than what people think is going to be going on economically, geopolitically, otherwise in six months. Markets look forward. So today may affect the very short term trader, but six months from now, it really affects the big trends of the market. And that's where I think there's going to be some very compelling, positive opportunity uh, over the at least intermediate term future. Day to day, geopolitics, Russia, Ukraine will uh, be a big determinant of things. Six months from now, the markets will be wh where people uh, uh, feel the economic and the world situation will be. Uh, hold a lot of cash for now and invest differently than you were uh, two or three months ago. George, I got to ask you, you're saying, you know, go to cash, but with inflation running so high, I mean, what's the what's the mindset there? Is it cash for, as you were mentioning, maybe a couple months in the future, everything's going to be A-OK, -okay, and then we can go in and buy stocks at a discount, even from where they are right now, where they're already in a correction? Uh, stocks are in a correction, and, and my guess is over the near near term, taking Russia and Ukraine, which is a total wild card out of it, that, that stocks were in a something between a pullback and a mild bear market phase uh, uh, prior to the, the Russian invasion. Um, I think that there is a very good chance that people will be able to will be investing in different sorts of securities. I, I think particularly in times of economic and, and world uncertainty, yield is going to be very compelling. Uh, not necessarily defensive stocks with a two and a half percent yield, but uh, for example, the uh, MLPs, Master Limited Partnerships, that are yielding six and a half, seven, seven and a half percent, and they're very secure yields. So people say, no matter what happens to the stock over the shorter term, I'm going to be paid enough to let me live all right. I think that's going to be an area of uh, uh, acute investment uh, interest. And there's some other sectors where it seems like there is sure to be uh, strong economic activity. Uh, cybersecurity is something people were aware of prior to these days. They're now more aware of it than ever. And uh, something like HACK, the, uh, the hack uh, uh, cybersecurity, ETF is a place that, that would appear to be a natural uh, magnetic force for people looking to invest now and into the future. 
Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. So you're talking about a rotation. I mean, obviously the cybersecurity side, right? We're seeing that this is kind of like our first real cyber war going on in the world. We always speculated what it would look like, but how bad or how not bad could it be? And we're starting to find that out. So within the hack, I mean, you're probably you got names like Fortinet, CrowdStrike, and all the all the ones that we know, Palo Alto Networks. Um, but I'm kind of wondering, so with the Russia-Ukraine scenario going on, it sounds almost like you're expecting this to wrap up here in the near term. And then does your main focus go back to inflation as we go into the second half of the year when you're talking about potentially seeing a, you know, a move back to the upside? What, what, what I believe the market is pricing in right now is that Russia will conquer the Ukraine, but be unable to occupy it. And there is a difference. You can conquer a country, but just as the Afghans, uh, after a while, who managed to throw out the Russians 40 years ago, us a, a couple of years ago, simply because con con countries cannot be occupied for any extended period of time. By the middle part of the year, that's the market's expectation. Uh, the, the market totally uh, uh, has absorbed the fact that there will be three or four or five or six Fed rate increases. Uh, the Fed communicates much better, much more quickly, much more clearly than it did in past years. And that's something that's not only priced into the market. If it didn't happen, it, it would be a, 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 a total shock. And therefore, from uh, the Fed standpoint and, and how the market views it, uh, I, I think that inflation will have subsided by the second half of the year enough that it'll be an annoyance to be dealt with by some future uh, uh, Fed hikes, but nothing that's going to be devastating to uh, uh, economies or to households. So inflation today, seven and a half percent, start of the second half of the year, four percent, end of the year, three percent, uh, not a big issue. And that's what the market expects today. Anything contrary to that could, could have a, a major upside or downside uh, tug on prices. Yeah. You know, actually, I was going to ask you and you kind of gave us the answer. So I, I'm just going to kind of reiterate and have you reiterate it is I was going to ask you is, did you think that, you know, Powell coming out and stating that 25 basis points for March was the right decision instead of 50? But if you're saying that inflation is going to drop down to four by July, um, you know, how do you see these hikes playing out? Is it 25 basis basis points a month until three, four five months down the road? Well, I would I say it's it's probably. 25 basis points times five, 125 basis points by uh, this time uh, uh, next year. Uh, and anything that's close to that, again, is pretty much baked into stock prices uh, uh, today. There is one factor that uh, makes me think that the market won't be devastated at the worst. By, again, borrowing a, a nuclear weapons and, and that sort of thing, which is very different than uh, when we had the, the, the Great Recession. Uh, back then, uh, EBITDA was, uh, you know, well, let me put it the other way, the other way around. Corporate debt was four and a half times EBITDA. Uh, in 2000, when we had the tech sell off, uh, corporate debt was three to three and a half times uh, corporate EBITDA. Today, corporate e EBITDA is one times corporate debt. So there's a lot of earnings power uh, underlying the economy and companies and stock prices today compared to past periods. That's not to say that we couldn't have, and I think there will be something of a further downturn, but uh, earnings are a great safety net under stock prices with much more, much less leverage uh, on them than we had in the past. The uh, leverage you know, can lead to very large losses or very large gains if you're lucky. But leverage is much less than it was before. And that's a distinct uh, positive for stock prices not, not falling particularly far in uh, 2022. George, do you, do you think to go back to what Eric said towards the top of the show? I mean, he's, he was talking about the declining growth going on and the unlocking of credit. And, and the reduction of savings accounts, and you're talking about earnings. So are the earnings from these companies, is that going to be coming from the credit of the consumer at this point in order to kind of stabilize the market for a turnaround? Well, uh, as Eric pointed out, the, the savings rate is 
two or six point three percent now, the lowest that it's been in in a, in a long time. But it's still uh, on a historic basis comparatively high. So there there are uh, relatively large uh, uh, sa- uh, increments going into the savings accounts of in- individuals. Then your question, I, I think, Daniel, is well, how vulnerable are the corporate uh, earnings? Not terribly vulnerable uh, over this year and, and and next year. We are not about to go into a recession. The uh, service economy has a long way to rebound. The, the goods economy, the per- productive uh, manufacturing side of it is, is quite robust. So although the economy and the earnings may be growing at a uh, declining rate, they are still growing. And I think the corporate earnings will, will be comparatively quite strong this year. And as, again, are a sound prop to stock prices uh, against anything that would be a teeth jarring uh, uh, bear market. Yeah. All right, George. So let's, as we wrap it up, right, where should investors be putting their capital to work right now? What are, what are the stocks that you are really favoring? Uh, I mentioned the master limited partnerships uh, disclaimer. I own, I own some of them because I think people are going to want se- comparatively secure uh, and not terribly volatile stocks as a part of their portfolio. I, I would buy a tech index that excludes the FANG or FANG plus stocks. I think that those great companies, the the Al- Alphabets, the Netflix, uh, the, the Met- Metas of the world are marvelous companies and very vulnerable to government attack. Their very greatness, I think, means that they may get the, the, the wings pulled off them like, like the wings off of a, 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 of a moth. And I would rather invest in tech broadly. Uh, RYT is an example of one such uh, non-mega mega cap uh, uh, tech stock. Uh, thirdly, I think there is a great deal of appeal in the uh, in, in the here and now to uh, the cyber uh, security companies uh, that we talked about before. So cybersecurity, it's a layup to continue to grow. Uh, people are going to be looking for yield and less volatility, MLPs and, and uh, some of the RATs, uh, things like that, and look for technology, particularly if uh, uh, the tech stocks get whacked further, but stay away from the, from the big cap stocks. They're too strong as monopolies or monopsonies uh, not to be attacked by the government. Yeah, there you have it, folks, from the legend himself, George Ball. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know our audience really appreciates it. Uh, you be well and have a great weekend, okay? Hey, thanks, Andrew. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. All right, guys. I do want to go ahead and point out real quick that Stephen Kress, our head of quantitative strategy here at Seeking Alpha, did put out an article this week about the three best cybersecurity stocks that he is watching right now from our quant system. It is definitely worth a read. You can head over to SeekingAlpha.com and find that. It's definitely worth your time. Now, let's go ahead and bring in Seeking Alpha's own Kim Khan for this upcoming week's Catalyst Watch. Hey, Dan. Um, next week, obviously, we're going to be very busy on the geopolitical front and the commodities front. Um, it's going to be quieter on the macro front because you've got um, the um, all the FOMC members in a quiet period going into the um, decision. But uh, it's also going to be very busy on the corporate front. And while earnings season is dwindling, um, you know, conference season is heating up and a lot of investor days as well. So just looking at my list, um, you know, a big one is going to be um, the Raymond James Annual in- Institutional Investors Conference. And also um, there's going to be a JMT Securities Technology Conference and Cohen has a healthcare conference next week. And um, you actually may see not just the usual um, granularity and numbers and um, strategy presented by um, the companies appearing, but you might get some in, input into how they're dealing with the Russia-Ukraine situation. As you know, a lot of companies have already kind of taken the lead of taking their business away from Russia or, you know, um, stopping doing business with certain partners based on sanctions of their own initiatives. So we could hear more from that. On the investor day front, um, there's AT&T, which is obviously going to be a lot of talk about, um, you know, finalizing that merger with Warner and Discovery. Um, we've got GE Investor Day um, and Kohl's as well. Um, ARK Invest has its monthly webinar, which is going to be closely watched to see what Kathy Wood says about, um, you know, all the trouble that um, the high-flying growth stocks have been having 
lately and whether they're going to, yeah, they can do in the um, kind of further geopolitical tumult times. And um, another thing we've got is um, Apple's product uh, event coming out where they will be, um, you know, unveiling some new new devices, including a lower cost 5G iPhone that's expected and um, an, a new AirPad. Um, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see if they'll say anything in a product delivery about their business with Russia. But actually, actually Apple, as we've written about, has taken the lead among tech companies in kind of pulling their business away from the Russian market. Yeah, and it feels like that might just be beginning, right? Could be a ton of more companies stepping up to follow Apple's lead because they have such dominance. We'll see what happens. Definitely. All right, Kim, you have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Thanks. All right, everyone, that wraps it up for us here on The Weekend Bite. Everyone stay safe out there and we'll see you again next week.